question is, can we learn enough about the brain and how we could implant systems so that we can help a wide variety of neurological diseases and disorders? So we uh, can take some inspiration from the idea that we have many systems that so-called write-in information. For example, artificial uh, vision systems that implant tiny chips on the front or behind the retina and then transduce light like a camera on your iPhone and then stimulate uh, the brain, uh, either the optic nerve or the brain directly, to produce some semblance of vision. And companies like Second Sight uh, have been doing these in FDA clinical trials, thousands, uh, hundreds of people for the past many years. And they work, and they get increasingly well. Most of us are familiar with uh, cochlear implants. In fact, uh, a room this size, typically many people know somebody with a cochlear implant to help with profound deafness by transducing auditory sounds through a microphone and then stimulating different electrodes along the length of the electrode that's put into the inner ear, not unlike playing different keys on the piano, plays different pitches. And this was even allowed, uh, and routinely allows, children who are born deaf, congenitally deaf, to learn uh, spoken language. So quite successful. And most recently, systems that trickle in electrical current to deep electrodes placed into the brain to help control Parkinson and tremor go in all the time. I call this collaborator here, Jamie Henderson, the Department of Neurosurgery, puts those in every week. And systems that can actually stimulate to avert epilepsy. So this is writing in because we are basically sending electric current into different parts of the nervous system. And where we send the electric current in has different functions. Now, if we flip the arrow around and ask ourselves about read out, which is the system I'll be concentrating on, there are systems that can now start picking up on electrical activity from the same deep brain stimulator electrodes that I was showing you, as well as picking up on signals that can then be computed upon and decide whether to stimulate other parts of the brain, so record from one area of the brain, stimulate another part of the brain uh, conditionally to help avert epileptic seizure trip. And this can help people uh, return to driving and other types of things. So if we imagine a future based on what I just described, but where we are able to record from thousands or even millions of individual cells in the brain, the neurons that convey information through their electrical impulses, and if we could stimulate thousands or even millions of those neurons, we could really read and write information directly from the brain, which sounds a little bit fanciful, but is rooted in medical technology that I just described. And finally, if we could engineer systems through low-power chips and so forth, so that we could implant these entire systems inside the body and walk around for decades without needing to access them, then we really would be up only against, I put it only in quotes, the profound question of neuroscience. The more we learn about where things happen in the brain, how things happen in the brain, the more intelligent we'll be able to interact with them to, again, really address the wide range of neurological diseases and disorders, which from psychiatric through movement disorders and sensory uh, uh, deficits. Okay, so let me now, on this funnel, zoom in acutely to the case of paralysis. And that's what the rest of the talk will be. Okay? That's where we focus most of our work. And this picture of Christopher Reeve, who many of you likely remember, uh, uh, was thrown from a horse in the mid-90s, broke his neck, was unable to move his arms or walk. And let's appreciate he was unable to speak uh, fluently because of the need for a ventilator. And this picture brings to mind an age-old proposition that makes one wonder, well, you know, even if those signals from the brain can't make it down the spinal cord to move his arm, can he think about moving his arm? Might we be able to eavesdrop in on that electrical activity? And if we know maybe not everything, but enough about those electrical signals in the brain, we can decode. And estimate how he'd like to move his arm uh, through space and time. And these types of systems 
uh, are called Bramish interfaces, where we can put a tiny electrode, I'll play a movie here in a second to show you how we put those in surgically. We can record electrical, this is like a voltage versus time, it's about a millisecond line, so-called accidental individual emissions of electrical pulses from individual neurons, from not just three, but hundreds of them, decode those in computer chips, and move robotic limbs or stimulate paralyzed musculature, or as I'll be focusing on moving computer cursors on a screen, and other things like that so that you can interface with computers and really return to the workforce or send messages to loved ones. So if we zoom in on one of these tiny little electrodes, which measures about four millimeters by four millimeters and has a 10 by 10 grid of one millimeter long electrodes, we can neurosurgically go to the surface of the brain. It is a neurosurgery, but uh, it's a, sort of a light neurosurgery, as my neurosurgery colleagues are fond of saying. And inserting it in, again, just the outer millimeter. And then we can take a look at the tips of each one of these electrodes which comes to rest near, randomly, different cell bodies. And then as those cells fire these voltage versus time pulses, we can pick up on those on these electrodes and then send those signals out to computers where we can do this decoding process. And currently that's done through a wired cable and a connector, but you can imagine that all being replaced. We're working on that, but if you're working on that, just the wireless transmitter, not like uh, our, unlike our phones. And by plugging into this connector and amplifier, we're able to take the signals on out to our computers and then set about the business of saying, uh, we think we know enough about how each neuron responds differently for wanting to move the arm, for example, to the right versus the left. For the, to the right, maybe this neuron fires a hundred of these action potentials per second. But if you want to move your arm to the left, maybe fires 10 spikes per second. And another neuron may fire more for up versus down. And another neuron may fire more for out versus in, and so forth. So you can imagine how you can invert that computation to estimate moment by moment how you want to move your arm. And that's exactly what you're going to see here. So this is one of our clinical trial participants. This is through this two decade long journey, come from animals and basic science and basic technology, and now to FDA type of clinical trials right here at Stanford and at about three other places in the country. And uh, this is one of our participants who suffers, unfortunately, from uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, unable to move her hands. But she's able to look at this computer screen that's right in front of her, okay? Uh, if I were to turn the lights up a little, we'd see the computer monitor here. And by thinking about moving her right hand, right or left or up or down, she's able to move that computer cursor, and you'll see this in the movie in a second, move it over this keyboard, and then by imagining squeezing her left hand as a click signal, like you or I might click on a mouse, she's able to select that key and slowly type out a message in response to the question, how do you encourage your sons to practice music? Okay. So this is running at real time, and this represents the state of the art of that vector of two or three in terms of the speed and the accuracy of these key selections. And this is approximately selecting 24 correct characters per minute, or about uh, six words per minute. Okay. And if I zoom in on this, and now instead of having her just free type messages, if I move instead to a so-called copy typing task, where she's asked to replicate when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, and this dials out that cognitive time of trying to think about what you want to type, this gets it in a more accurate typing rate, like you or I might have taken a touch typing class uh, back in high school. And we're able to achieve about 32 correct characters per minute, or about eight words per minute, which for me, it's about like I do on my phone, but you know, my daughters, they laugh at me. This is these double ways to go. Okay. So, last two slides. We can replicate that in multiple participants. I want to make sure that you are left understanding that this is not just a one-off idiosyncratic result. 
Okay. We've now replicated this as part of a multi-site clinical trial that we conducted at Harvard in about 15 participants. Okay. And this correct characters per minute um, is, you know, it does vary from day to day, but even out to two, three, four years after we put the electrodes in, it continues to work. So it's not like the electrode arrays are um, becoming useless after a certain period of time, but there's tons of engineering and material science going on on campus around the country to make those last many decades, to make them more uh, uh, invisible to the immune system. And finally, uh, though it's a bit of a detailed point, you might have noticed that the keyboard that we were using was optimized somehow. It clustered in the center, more commonly used letters. That's borrowed from the field of human computer interfaces, like our colleagues in computer science do. And you're able to achieve a slightly higher rate than standard QWERTY keyboard that we have on our computers. But the performance in both cases was very high. The last slide is to say, OK, that's a custom keyboard, but surely you're not going to rewrite all software. So we just bought a tablet running Chrome and said, well, just go to town. Use it for whatever you wish. So that tablet's here. I'm replicating it here so you can see it better. She's able to move on the standard keyboard. Okay, And now there's word completion. And she can just go up and select the words. She's an avid gardener. So she uh, wanted to go look at some information about orchids. We did not turn on accessibility mode, meaning these letters are quite small because we wanted to really put to the test the precision with which we're able to control this cursor. And again, this is quite uncommon levels of control. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's common for us, but this is how the field is advancing. As you or might do, she gets tired of reading about these things, goes to image search, and just wants to look at some great pictures. You know, it's very human. <laughs> it's like we can do the same thing. And there you go. Okay, so you can use mail programs and GChat and you know anything you can do on a tablet, she's now able to do. And this is starting to move beyond what the clinical trial truly is, which is a safety trial, just to make sure it's safe but to also start pushing into efficacy and actually restore some benefit or quality for it. Okay. So I'll put this up as conclusions and happy to take questions.